Welcome to Run With It, the podcast that brings you business ideas from established entrepreneurs. Each episode, you'll hear a new business idea and the exact steps our guest would take to get started. Follow through and you can earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership. Here are your hosts, Chris Justin and Ethan Janney. I'm Chris Justin. And I'm Ethan Janney. And on today's show, we have Justin Hartsman. Justin has always had an entrepreneurial mindset. When he was 10 years old, he worked in an outdoor lifestyle store that his grandparents owned in the small city of Kingston, Ontario. While working at the store, he made it his mission to sell as many backpacks as possible. He found it thrilling to identify a person's need and find the perfect solutions for them, even at that young of an age. Justin is an internet visionary that has pioneered markets. He has more than 18 years of startup and exit experience. Previously, he founded the first brokerage for online businesses. During that time, Justin brokered $100 million in transactions to Fortune 1000 companies, PE firms, family offices, and venture funds. His plethora of experience making visions turned into reality makes him a known and respected player in the industry. There's nothing he loves more than fixing problems. Justin sees himself as more of a leader and a mentor rather than a boss. He creates teams of meticulously picked industry specialists to help achieve his goals. Justin, welcome to the program. I'm just a regular guy. I don't know. I, that's very nice <laughs> to write about me, but I'm just a guy sitting at home with COVID like the rest of you with dogs and cats and kids running around. So uh, I'm Justin. That's all you need to know. That's good. Well, that leads us to our kickoff question, just to kind of break the ice here. Tell us um, one of your most embarrassing business moments. Well, I'll give you one just because it recently comes to mind. and. Uh, it was just happened the other day, actually. I was sitting here in front of Zoom, which I should have bought the stock beforehand, obviously. I don't know. All of us should have. Um, <laughs> and I'm with some lawyers, some regulators, and some people. And I'm wearing, you know, I'm dressed from my waist up, obviously, uh, like everyone else is, properly in a shirt. And I'm talking away. And at really a pertinent point, I'm, I'm really like, red in the face. I'm upset about something that's going on in business. And Nothing's going my way. And I get my little two-year-old daughter walk down the stairs, start naked, sits on my lap and won't leave and just cries for five minutes. I made them all sit there and listen to it. And so I was like, I see are you okay? They walked away. And then I went right back to my tirade afterwards. So it was a little, it was, it was, uh, it was a funny moment, but uh, I get, and again, and no one out there, don't be apologetic about it. Like that's just what life is right now. Get used to the, hopefully a temporary normal, but that's what it's like. SNL just had a uh, a skit on Zoom meetings that I saw that came out. We'll link to that in the show notes. But yeah, it's it's funny because the example that you shared is actually more extreme than what they, <laughs> taught, than what they did. Um, funny, but yeah, that's a that's a good moment. Um, well, a good bad in, moment. <laughs> good bad moment. Well, it's fine yeah. for me, but it's um, like they got to see this little girl, anyways. <laughs> Well, Justin, I want to hear a little bit more about your businesses, but we'll save that for the end. The idea behind our podcast is to bring something fresh to the listeners and have a fresh experience for you. So the entire intent and the goal is to come up with a new business idea that we would like to share with the listener and outline some action steps for them to be able to follow through and implement. Love it. That's what I love to do. Building businesses is awesome. I like... And honestly, I, th- I think myself more than most people, I like the building of businesses even more than the operational running of them at a later time. Like that's what I'm good at that part. And now you have to hire all the better people to do the actual running of them later. So I'm excited to talk about this. I think uh, not that it's the craziest idea in the world, but I think it's one that's needed and it's really timely. And I don't know when this podcast will actually hit the air, but I think it's good for now and into the future. So I'm excited to talk about that. I love it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's kick it off. What's the idea that you would like our listeners to run with? Well, it's something that exists right now. And I guess there's my dog just showed up. So, uh, sorry. That's cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I don't know where we're in. I'm in Toronto and I don't know where our list is from, probably all over the world uh, looking in. I and mean, we have, you know, click and collect or you have Instacart where you are. And those are great services. And they're run by third parties that are really big. They're taking big fees. And I think a lot of people are are learning that those fees are extraordinary right now. And it's the difference between in COVID a time, if you order from a restaurant directly, they can make money. If you order from another, a third party app, they could lose money on that. It's it's like that stark of a difference. So a big thing that's happening now is this curb collect sort of situation. I think there's a huge need for that. And it's going to be not only now, 
but into the future, I think is a great way to get things done. And if uh, I think the idea as a whole should be a service, much like Shopify, and they're a good company to do this or have an extension for it or someone out there. But it's actually a way, a really easy way that a entrepreneur, a local store owner can set up click and collect in an efficient way. So right now, I know there's a grocery store down the street. I can email them and say, I need blah, 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 blah. And they'll just put whatever in a cart, send out, send me my bill. That's okay right now, but like that doesn't really work for me. I like to know what I'm getting. I have specific brand types. And this is not only for groceries. This is for everyone, by the way. If we can make a really easy app that goes in, they can scan the UPC code of their product from a database, grab that information, put their price on it, and give an inventory list and allow you to choose those just like you would anywhere else shopping, pop them into a cart, and then text message you or send you an app message telling you it's ready to pick up. That's great for now because you can't go anywhere. But even into the future, when I'm on the way home from work and I want eggs and flour because my wife needs it for something and X, Y, and Z, then it'd be great just to click on that, have it done and roll up, have it paid for, grab it from them and go. I don't even have to go in the store even if it's for three or four items. And this can work with your local art gallery. This can work with your you know, cell phone store. It can be anything, but a really simple way to do it that is store-based. And the way that, you know, I don't know if we will get into this question later, but the difference is it's managed and run by the store. The processing is where you make a little piece on it, but 30% of that purchase isn't going back to a third-party app. So the idea is a SaaS fee model that the people can pay for whether it's $19.99 a month, whatever it is, and it can be a varying model. And giving people the new way of shopping, which I think for a lot of busy people is really an efficient, good way to do it. So that's my idea that's come out of this time, to be honest with you. To be clear, you're not talking about delivery. You're talking about curbside pickup? Curbside pickup specifically, allowing people to do that, not having to go around. The fact is, if I know if I'm driving by that store, I need to pick up a pair of socks for a meeting tomorrow. I can go on there. I know I picked a pair of socks. It's ready. They run it out to my car. Either I paid by credit card on the app or I give them cash and they whatever, a debit machine. But I can go. I don't have to go in. I have to look through the store. I don't have to do it. It's ready with my name on it. I think it's a really good model that um, I'm enjoying now out of this. And I think it would be very useful into the future. That's one thing about this time is that it's a place where habits are shifting for people. And so things that they wouldn't have done in the past, they'd be like, oh, why would I do curbside pickup? You know? And it's like, if you have to do it for a little while, not only do you get in the habit of it, and so you're like kind of craving to do it later on when it's not available, but also having been forced to do it, you're like, oh, well, actually, now that I tried it for a little bit, I, I want that. I like that. That's actually a good thing. Absolutely. And I think that's what comes like I, my store that I grocery shop at, I'm like everyone else I grocery shop, the click and collect spots, you go in, I see them. And every time I pull in, I go, why didn't I do that before? It seemed like a good idea, but it never came to me and it never made sense. And I didn't, I didn't like to pay the extra, you know, whatever it was, $9 to do that. And I didn't like it. I could pick it up when they told me to pick it up. But now that I've been forced into those scenarios for good reason, I believe it makes a lot more sense. So I think it's kind of brought a more light to what that is. And I think moving forward, we realize there's a lot less need for and I hate saying this, but for local retail shops that aren't really with the times that are allowing us to make things easier in a simple fashion. I'm all for small business as much as Amazon hits my house three times a day, even right now. Um, small business is key to me. You know, in my bio, that's where my family started in small local retail shops, and it's hurting them greatly right now. You got to support them, people. Those are the people that listen. small businesses are our, our backbone our economy, of our economy. If we're not feeding money to them, people don't have jobs. So I trust that. And this is a way to help those small businesses. And even at Needles, the genesis of that product, and we're not going to get into that right now, was to help small businesses give them that equal playing field that these other large businesses uh, had and small businesses never could get their hands on. So I think it just plays into always being with that frame of mind. This is an interesting thing, the local supporting local businesses and the way that our economy is changing in such a way where things have gone online and then it kind of forces the local businesses out of business. And then you see these weird things happening where Amazon now starts opening like local shops <laughs> where you can pick things up and they've got Amazon Go. It's a transition. And so we're learning new things about how we want the economy to work. But I think that one of the disadvantages 
is there is something nice about having local shops. You know, we don't all want to just live in a bed with a catheter and a bedpan and have everything delivered to us. You know, I mean, ultimately, that is not what we want out of our lives. We want shops we can go walk around and people that we know and, and community and all these things. And we forget about it when we want convenience. I'm with you. Like, the, you know, but the problem is this. And again, I refer back to Needles. I know it so well, our company, but it's tough as a small business or online business. The reality is, um, you're selling black t-shirt. Like I'm going to trust Amazon that if anything happens, that I can send it back to them and my credit card's not getting stolen. I don't want to go to justinsblacktshirt.com and pay 15% more when I don't know the reality of what's going to come out of that in that scenario. So, we, But we have to change that narrative a little bit. And I think it's just the trusted names that people like in this, this big behemoth, which also should have bought Amazon stock before all this happened. But we should shop local, especially during this time. Go pick up from your restaurants. And uh, I know this might come out after COVID, I hope, because hopefully we come out of this soon. But know that we're thinking about it. I like this idea for a couple of reasons. One, when I go grocery shopping, it always takes me way longer than it should to find, you know, random like nut flour of some sort, like almond flour. If I'm looking for that, it's something that I don't buy frequently. So I, I feel like I end up spending twice as long in the grocery store. So if I could save some time, that would be big benefit. Right now, also, there's the exposure factor of longer you're in a place, in a public place, a young son. Have you been in a grocery store since this happened? Have you- I have. I try to limit it to once a week. But it's like a war zone. It's anxiety ridden. I don't want my family going. I go. I'm in there. I have a black hoodie on. I have this black hat. I have a black mask on. I have my gloves on. I see people I know. Like I like I, I, I avoid them by ever, even eye contact, hoping they won't talk yeah. to me. And like, yeah, <laughs> the crazy people that are like, and I'm far, I keep my history, but they're like, please, sir, like, you're too close. Like, step back. I'm like, dude, like, we're far enough apart. Calm down. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a tough thing right now. That's for sure. Yeah. And also, I guess from the business side, it's appealing to me because I always say this. That I do marketing as well. And I know Needles is a marketing agency. You guys have been extremely successful doing that. I think it's really hard to be competent at your core skill and marketing or and curbside pickup. Something that you don't do, and it's hard to compete against someone like Amazon if you have to do all of that yourself. And it makes much more sense to fragment that and outsource it to a different company. And as as we say all the time, is like the genesis of needles is to let you do what you do best, which is your business. You know, if that's painting walls and you're a great painter, do that. Marketing should not be what you spend your evenings on. You should spend that with your friends, family, whatever is important to you. So if we can automate that, make those things easier effective, easier and cheaper for you. That's what we should be trying to do with everything. Marketing is now a commodity. Marketing is less of a science anymore. Well, it is a science, less of an art, I should say, than it is a science at this point. You put dollars in, you have equations, they come out the other side. Spend the time on what you're good at. So yeah, I think that's right. And I think that's what plays this idea is that, A, we're getting away from the big third-party apps out there who are taking a huge portion of it make it easy enough that you can do it, keeping money in your pocket, making it more convenient for people. And we're still out in public shopping locally. Those are all important things, in my opinion. So let's flesh this out a little bit further. How would you go about solving it? What are some of the first steps that you would take? Well, uh, in any business, and I'm going to take, talk very generically, is uh, go talk to people. Understand what it is that they're suffering through, what it is that is working right now, what are the gaps that we can fill, and are they willing to pay for my service before I even hand it to them? Will you give me $99 if I deliver you this product in three months from now? All I'm asking is for $99 and it's free for you from life. And if they're willing to pay today, it gives you some sort of sign that it is a a true problem and it's a true need that they have. And it's probably one that you, you, you can solve and solve before them. And I don't think this idea, while I have some harebrained ideas out there, this one specifically is very doable. There's existing software out there that can be edited and configured to what you need. And I think it's a, a low cost startup for at least, you know, your proof of concept getting to before you get to full scale market getting out there. So I think it's very doable. Would you approach uh, a certain niche or how would you, who would you start approaching? I would start it by like a very geofence location. This isn't spray and pray. Like I know I go to the people that I knew or an area that I spend time in normally that I, you know, if I shook someone's hand, they know who I was maybe and offer them that solution and see if it works and offer to sit there and, uh, and help them out with it. 
um, I would definitely take it a very limited approach to begin with. Because again, the, like thinking past this idea, building the software and then finding a community to help you get it out there where you have boots on the ground to do it. So sort of the franchise model might be a really good one to think about doing this instead of sitting there from my house or, or my office in Toronto and trying helping someone in Cary, North Carolina to set it up. Why not have those boots on the ground? And then you're bringing more people, you're bringing an army to this idea that's going on. And it becomes more of a, you know, work from home opportunity that become an actual business, which I think is interesting. I'll bring up a scenario that maybe something like this is supposed to address. So a couple of weekends ago, uh, we decided to order food for pickup, which, you know, we haven't really done it all. We're playing it super safe. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, yeah, let's it's Sunday. Let's just like order a nice breakfast from that place. We used to go to breakfast too. I did the same thing three times. In yeah. Total. <laughs> and it was kind of, it was weird because we put in the order and then I went, I took my son out a little bit, got him some air, rode him around on the bike and stuff. And then... We got there maybe, they said it'd be ready in 15 minutes, but we got there in like a half hour. So I figured, oh yeah, it's totally ready. It's ready to pick up. And they came out and they couldn't find my name. And then they were like, well, what's the, what's the first name? I gave my wife's first name. And then they ended up giving me an order and I took it home. We opened it up with the wrong order with somebody else with the same first name. And then we had to go back and we had to call again. And, you know, by the time we got our food, it was like an hour later and they had just written I don't know, maybe just my first initial and my last name on this bag or something. And that's, that's a losing proposition for all everyone, too. It's, you lost your time and maybe your son was frustrated and hungry. Right. And it, there's no way that they made the two meals a second time that they're making money off that on their slim margins. Right. So that's exactly what we're addressing here is a way that technology can help them in the simplest form where they're not reliant on that third party or having to pay that third party. So I, I agree. I think that could help solve exactly, well, mostly those issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does there need to be a physical component of this? Just thinking of Ethan's example, having a little barcode printer or something that it prints out a label, you stick it on the bag. Do you need to have something like that in order to have this proof of concept? Or I don't think so. I think that's something that comes down the road and that's an add on what you're doing. The reality is just that, if you have an order that's on a phone that you're servicing, that you can look at, that you can go back to, it wasn't your handwriting or someone else on a phone that is handing to you. You can go through, you can place it in a bag, you know, even instructions you give them, you know, get your bag out, write this person, here's the information has to be on that bag before you even see what goes into it. And like, so just giving them the step-by-step -step of to try and avoid those problems. Those are the little things I love to solve, like getting, 10,000 printing machines to go is an expensive proposition. It's, it's uh, it, Maybe they don't want them. Maybe it doesn't work and you don't want to do that. Use instructions. Just, what would help you as a person? That's what everyone has to think about when you're problem solving here is you don't always have to go to technology solving. You don't have to go to building something. It's just what would you logically need in your own brain to try and solve that issue at the easiest form? And like, I didn't think about it until the second, but yeah. Order number 59.95 comes in. Step one, get a bag out. Step two, write these four, three things on that bag. Step four, fill it out. And every time you put in the bag, check it off. And until you've checked that off, I'm not even showing you the next product to put in that bag. So you can't screw this thing up. So I think that would be just doing stuff like that and thinking about how your brain might want to do it would help other people as well. I'll second that. I just signed up for G Suite for a new website email address that I have today. And for the listener that doesn't know, that's, you know, Google hosting of your website and email. Use it or don't use any email. <laughs> <laughs> but I noticed they have, you know, like a setup process, right? And there was like an instructional page and it had like a bunch of steps. But I also realized when I was going through the steps, I was like, this looks like it's been around since like 10 years ago. This like set of instructional steps. And it was literally just like a step-by-step -step procedure of like how to get everything checked off and set up for, for G Suite. And it did make me think it was like, this is a multi-billion dollar company. And all they really need to make things work is just somebody took the time to put a nice checklist together for people. <laughs> That's your best tool. Make a checklist. Like just have a, I have my book right here. I write it all the time. I know it's not new for me. Everyone will tell you the same thing. Oh, just, oh sorry. Drop my little, I love you dad card out of the book for my daughter. But <laughs> nice. uh, she guess she hid that in there. That's very nice of her. But yeah, just have that list and write it down, check it, do it. I have ones on my computer so I can share it. I have ones on my desk. Just make checklists. I think this is also really interesting because a lot of times a listener or want to be entrepreneur may... 
think of this idea and then they'll think about like, oh, I need to do all these other things. I need to get printers. I need to do things like that. So can you tell us, maybe share some more examples, put on the opposite hat of what you normally do. Mm -hmm. What are some of the pitfalls that you think a novice entrepreneur might run into that you would avoid? To answer your question is I think a lot of what happens is people get wrapped up in their own head and wondering like, what if not? Like, what if that just didn't work? But my brain doesn't think that when I try to get everyone to think when I have, I love talking to entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, people just starting out, like you see a problem, come up with five ways that you might solve it, then talk to five more people and get five ways that they might solve it and find the overlaps. And where there's overlaps is probably a good rationale of what's going to you know get you to the problem solved. I think it's fear. I think that's what the problem is. People are worried about failure. And when you're an entrepreneur, you know, you're on the other side of crazy, you know, that's, I'm nuts. You have to be, because this is not an, an easy world out there and you get tons of no's and you get slapped in the face all the time. You just have to be able to get back up and know that doing it wrong is all part of the learning process. I think like most things we do are wrong and our I do is wrong. And someone tells me that usually my wife <laughs> doing it wrong. And then you find a solution, you get it right eventually. So I think it's just, not letting your worries get in the way and just keep pushing forward. Just keep going to that next step. If you can't solve it right now, go do something else, come back to that problem. But talking it out, having a core group of people that are not your friends, but are people that you trust who have done something in the past or are at least working towards similar goals that you are, go and become part of those groups and, and talk about that, that situation. A little bit extra on the other side of crazy idea. I think it was in, in a Noah Yuval Harari book, uh, either Sapiens or, or um, Homo Deus or something like that. He's, he's talking about entrepreneurs, especially, and corporations. And he's seen this example of how, as humans, we, we have this incredible ability to, to like believe things are real that are definitely not real. Like a corporation is really not real. <laughs> you know, the only <laughs> reason it's real is because there's a piece of paper that says it is. And there's a bunch of people that agree that it's real. And that like Nike only exists in people's minds. And I think that's part of what's going on with entrepreneurs in this other side of crazy thing is like Noah actually makes this sort of proposition that, that entrepreneurs are almost like witch doctors, being able to conjure things out of thin air that never existed before and kind of like share a vision with other people that's, that's almost imaginary, something like that. It's not even conjuring though. It's like you've conjured the idea, then you're so passionate about it that it's real. Like exactly. that's, that's the case. There's, there's no other way of looking at it. Like, I know that to be the case right now because that's the only thing that's going through my head. I can't think of it any other way. Right, right. So at this point, with the idea, we've talked to a bunch of local business owners. We get buy-in on proceeding with a development for it. They paid us 99 bucks or whatever amount that you think is relevant. What's the next step? The next step is... So this may have been the first step or the second step. So the second step would be Depending, and most people aren't, and I'm definitely not, and I think it's been the bane of my business existence is that myself and my co-founders are not technical co-founders. So we have three business guys with different sets of the skill sets, but non, you know, we are technical. I can read code, I can understand, I can solve problems, but I can't. I'm not a coder. I'm not an engineer. I'd find someone who's as close to a partner or becomes a partner because again. You know, owning 100% of nothing is nothing. Even if you split a pie by 50, it's much bigger. It makes more sense, wherever that saying goes. Find that right person that can really stand by you, stand by your side, and help you produce what you're looking for. And then the best thing past that, once you've done that, is put everything down on paper. Every thought you've had, every idea, just spew it out. And after you spew it out, come back a few days later and organize it after that. And then the two of you or three of you or the person that you hired come, brainstorm that, put it up on a whiteboard, write it on your window, whatever it takes, and build a plan around it. And I'm not a big business plan writer. I've done a million in my life, whether it's in business school, whether it's in, you know, for some company that we have to we're applying to for a grant or whatever it may be. I don't love them. I think they're very they're hard to pivot away from because it looks silly when you're doing it at a later time. So I think you should just write a vision document and really make sure that you are writing down what is the core focus of what you're trying to serve, how you think you're going to do that, your hypothesis, and then what you're looking for the, as a conclusion on the other side. So um, it's kind of like 
because startups are experiments. It's kind of like that biology or chemistry experiment you did in school, your hypothesis, some steps you're going to take, and when the conclusion that you hope to come from it, then you can match that up at a later time. But knowing that every time that you learn a little bit more, you talk to someone else or you think about it, those are micro pivots that you're learning from and do those micro pivots. And if there's a major pivot that's these and takes you off your game, do it. Like the fact is like, there's a reason for that. Uh, I get stuck in the trap that I'm so vision focused that I don't, and even people I trust are telling me to do something else. I might be slower to the uptake and the pivot because I'm really passionate about it. That's I think a big problem that I have and people should try and get out of before they start is things are always changing. Nothing happens A, B, C. It's usually A, Z, B, you know, just in a complete different order. Embrace that and live with it. An objection that comes to mind that a business owner might share is, I want people to come into my store. I want them to shop around. I want them to not only come in and head straight to the milk and the eggs or whatever, the flour. What would you say to a grocery store owner who says, this will reduce my overall sales because people aren't going to be picking up other things that they didn't know that they needed. Great question. You know, that's something that I always, in anything we do, you know, trial it out. And the fact is maybe it might decrease the amount of people in your store, but does it also increase theft and slippage? Does it also mean that you can have less staff, which I'm, I don't really advocate for because I want people to have jobs. I don't want to take jobs away from people. There's always ways to understand what it's doing for you. And what I would try to do is build out a model saying, here's how you promote this app. It's not the fact that you tell no one to come here, put your, close your door and put it on your store. Like you have to use this. It's, you know, when you hand them a bag and say, next time if you can't come in or you're in rush, try this out, try this thing out for you. And they might add a small fee to it. It might deter people. But there's a whole group and it, or only things are changing right now. You know, I, I belong to a lot of local groups in our area. And my wife runs a very big with 30,000 local people. And everyone says that they like that local store for that reason, because it is the place that they can go in and talk and see those people. So there's a group of people who are always going to do that. And those are that's fine. And we want to keep it that way. But can we incrementally change the amount of people that do come to your store because you offer that and the guy next door doesn't? So it's something that I would also you know, trial it out, see if it's working, see if people are coming in. And I think the idea with all of this, with this idea as a whole is, I think it's a learning curve for everyone because I think that we're changing the way that we're uh, we're going about things and that we're going to live our life for the next little while. And I hate to, well, I love making predictions whether they're right or wrong, but I think it's going to be different because this is different for some time. Like, I don't think, I can't see allowing my kids, even the government and local government, federal government says my kids can go to camp this summer. I don't really feel that comfortable doing that. And I'm not a fear monger by any means. I just like, I'm scared for them. So what can I do at home or what can I do to keep them out of stores? I don't, they're not coming with me shopping now. We're on a Saturday morning. My daughter or daughters and I would walk into a grocery store and we'd dream up all the stuff and throw in a cart and love that. I don't know if that's going to happen as much, at least for the foreseeable future into, you know, 18, 24 months. When will we get back to it? I don't know. So I, as preferences and ways of doing things change, I think this is an adapt an adaptation to that. And if you're not doing it as a small business owner and you say, I don't want to, you might be the one who's losing out. And it might be the difference of having more people come to your store or not. So I kind of tell them that story. An addendum to something like this, I'll just bring up. If you started with grocery stores, and I'll just use this as an excuse for like a business idea I had like 10 years ago, just to throw it in here. <laughs> you know, going shopping, uh, we brought this up earlier, going, sh- going shopping, you can just kind of wander around and you can waste a lot of time in a grocery store. And I've always thought that there's some place and maybe now's the time to add an addendum to something like this to plan out a menu, right? You plan out your menu, like there's a site or an app that helps you plan out your menu ahead of time. Like, what do you want to eat that week? And the shopping list is really a collateral from what you planned out. It already exists, my man. Oh, really? It does. It tells you what what aisle it's in? They thought that a long time ago. You go, you choose your recipes on recipe.com. And then it prints out a list uh, and tells you what uh, aisle they're in and all that good stuff. If it knows the local grocery stores, because it actually, we had a project that failed going back to that. You know, we talked about that uh, was called, um, I don't even remember now. But what it was, was that the whole idea is what we wanted. You could pick recipes or you could pick, just make a list of what it is that you wanted to buy. 
And what we would do is make you a grocery list right down to the aisle that it was in because all this data is online. There's APIs that provide this for you. And then we'd match that up with a coupon. So it was uh, it was actually called Cheaply, actually. It was a coupon. So we would go, you need these things, go to store X and get those five items. If you want, you say, go to one store for the best savings or I'm willing to go to multiple stores. And in multiple stores, they go get those five items with those coupons on store A, B, C, D, and you get it. But yes, there is, uh, I think it's recipe.com even, or all recipes, that if you choose a couple recipes that you want for that week, it will print you out the grocery list of things that you do need. And not by the aisle, I don't believe, but by like, produce, by whatever the different sections in the grocery store are. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, it would be nice if that would got just sent directly to the grocery store and just turned into your order. You didn't even have to take an extra step. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to keep driving toward picturing this as a concrete idea. So the implementation of this, are you picturing both a, a phone app and a website interface? Does there need to be a backend API? What are some of the actual technical aspects? I think that an app is probably good for this, whether, you know, both platforms, you know, uh, Android and iPhone. But I don't think it needs to be much more than that. I don't think we have to get more difficult than that because, no, not an API either. Because the, I, the whole point of this is, is that we are no longer reliant on the Instacarts and Ubers of the world where they're taking it. This is a self-run platform. If it's working for you, do it. If it's not working for you, don't. And there's lots of ways that you can gamify and ensure it does work for a store as you as the company. but your idea, you put your inventory in there, you put your whatever it may be, and you just go with it and you keep your profits. The whole idea is an expense that is fixed. And you know that you're paying $19 a month to have this option to do curbside pickup. And then if people use credit card on there, you know, credit card processing is built right in, you know, as the company, whoever's creating this product, they can take a small piece of that processing fee and that's where they can make their money. But the whole other thing goes back to the store and it comes down to they, they have a lot of times that they're not doing things that gives them the ability to do something that can help them make more money. And it's not marketing. So you're picturing that they would actually input all the inventory into the app themselves. Absolutely. I think the fact is this is supposed to be for small stores. This is not meant for large corporations. This is back to Main Street. This is you know getting them into the digital age. It's way better. You know, I, you know our local government, John Tory. Uh, the mayor of Toronto, he's a huge startup advocate, and he just, they just poured $250 million into what he calls their digital mainstream project. And what that is, is building websites with an e-commerce capability, not even built on Shopify, that they help you do and give you grants to do. Well, like, I'm sorry, but that really isn't going to do anything for your local business now, just getting them with an online presence. Give them something that's easy to use that actually allows them to offer a service they don't have before that they can do themselves, not something they need a third party to help them with. I think it's super important because again, spend the time what you're good at. You know, these little stores and I go back to groceries just because that's what we're all buying right now. But you know, a local fruit stand, they're at five in the morning picking up all their different fruits from the fruit terminal or the fruit and vegetable terminal. Well, they know right then and there, if they're picking up, 70 cantaloupes, put in 70 cantaloupes and take a picture of it right there. They're doing it anyways. It's probably better for their own inventory management if they have or don't have it previously, which they probably don't. And now they've given themselves the ability to have curbside pickup all at the same time. So I think that's really what I'm going to is a simple project that is effective for Main Street that can be a big business, but is not on like this is not the scale of Uber per se when they come down to these things. And you know what? Like, it doesn't matter scale because look at just this week and I talk about what I know best, but uh, Fedora pulled out of Canada. You know, like it's just they're getting too much pressure. All the delivery people are saying we want to unionize because we're not, you know, we don't get paid enough and you're making all this money. And they left with Canada holding uh, from a German company that ho- with Toronto holding a four point seven million dollar debt. They're, they're probably not going to pay back and people unpaid because it wasn't working here. And they decided it's the wrong market for them. Like that's a, or we got to try and avoid those things into the future. Are you picturing that consumers would be using this app as well? Uh, consumers in uh, in the like way people of, who want to shop from these local stores, they have to yes, use that. that that's okay. exactly what I mean. Because my point I brought up earlier is when I go to my local grocer now, or I go to the place I want to pick up a new shirt from, 
I'm like, I need a new, I have a meeting. I need a new shirt, you know? Uh, I don't want them just to put anything random in a bag. When I ask for chicken, chicken breasts at the grocery store right now, and they come put it in my trunk and me touching it, I don't see what I get till I get home. I just said chicken breasts. They could have given me $50 worth because that's what they packaged it up as. So the fact that you can actually know what you're looking at or I've chosen a brand and it's based on that, I think it's a lot better because people are just going with, email me a list and what we can do, we'll send you. And I think that's okay because we're scrambling now, but there's a way to solve that into the future. Because, you know, like if this happened, it could happen again. Like, and I hate to say that, but like what determines the second wave or what happens when the, just like the flu, there becomes the super flu, the super virus of the coronavirus that we don't know. Is this something that becomes more normal the same way that people might not like there becomes less need for in office, which everyone, even me, I'm a huge advocate of an office. Like I wear button up shirt, a, a, a sport jacket every day. I'm not looking like I normally do. I'm shaved the whole deal. I'm a huge advocate of that. I like the camaraderie. I think that I can get my ideas across better than in front of us on, on a Zoom call. But that's kind of changed for me now. Like if kids weren't home and distractions weren't around, sitting at home isn't the worst thing in the world. You can get focused. You aren't looking at other stuff. I'm not saying I'm going to that. My team will laugh at me when they hear this, but uh, I see a lot of people changing. Like I know I'd love to save the whatever tens of thousands of dollars we spend a month in, in rent. It seems like a, a bargain not having to do that, you know? So those are just, things are changing. The world always changes. This is a dramatic change right now. You always got to be flowing and, and finding those opportunities within it without being predatory. And I think that's the biggest piece. Going back to the action steps, just want to check in on how you make a decision like this. We talked about, say, maybe getting pre-sales for $99 from businesses. Is there a specific number of sales you'd say, okay, now let's start pursuing this? Or you know, would it be amount of money? Would it be amount of people signed on to that project? Where would you would you create a cutoff where you'd say, okay, now we're going to start building or putting something together? I think that if you could speak, you know, go out and speak to a hundred people, and you see that you're getting a good percentage of those, and not fifty percent, fifty percent of you know a hundred people in the local is like a very like if you see ten to fifteen percent of those people that have interest and are willing to do that, I think that's a really good sign to begin with. Again, you know, you love a hundred percent, but reasonably knowing business conversion rates are really low. You know, they're not, it's really groceries again, back to that really high. You have to, you have to buy them, but anything else, any other service, your conversion rates are super low unless you are a desperate need for someone. So knowing that you're not desperate need, which are only a very few things in this world, understand that a 10 to 20% conversion rate is pretty good. Got it. 10 to 20%. And then you, you would, would you ask for a year's worth of the subscription up front? I would ask for it and I see if they're willing to do it. I don't think I would take it, but I would just knowing that they said yes. And at the end say, don't worry about it. I, I'll give it to you. I would like you to be a pilot of this and, and champion with me, I think is a better way of going about it. Unless you have to have cash to do this, which I don't think you'll be enough to do much at the beginning. And, but I don't think also having money is, should be the limiting factor of if you should start or try something. The, uh, Reality is there's a lot of help out there. There's a lot of people who can do it. And raising money is a very difficult thing. And uh, I don't think every idea... I've, I've raised a lot of capital for my companies in the past. Really good, awesome experiences, thousands of no, few yeses. I don't always think it's the best, the best thing. I think bootstrapping after being through that is an even better thing for people to try and do right now. Can you be, start a business by being scrappy, spending the least amount of money, and just by working hard at it. And if you can really show that, I think that's where uh, the best things come out of. Eventually, you do need money. Don't get me wrong. Can that come from sales? It doesn't have to come from investment. So it's key that you do have the technical co-founder who's able to build the app for you without you having to... That's exactly, that's exactly it. Because, because the other thing is, if you're not technical and you've never been technical, and this is your first forte into it, you can get literally dragged through the coals out there with a technology partner who knows you don't know much about it. your timelines get extended your budgets are crazy out there you don't even understand what a budget should be like honestly most things in today's day and age as a proof of concept really shouldn't cost more than ten thousand dollars to get out the door to try honestly i'm telling you i can have pretty much any app in the world made right now from a decent developer for ten thousand dollars to at least get you going to try something, and that's not chump change. Ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. I'm not diminishing that, 
but uh, if you don't have that, it's worth having a technical co-founder who can really spend their time and passion to do what they do and give you the time to do what you need to do best. How would you get this app being used by the consumers? There's a lot of ways. Easy marketing, again, talked about it before, join these community groups. I'm sure you guys have one on Facebook for your local areas where it's mums, dads come together. They share you know, good things, bad things, what's going on. Offer it in that community. Do it that way. Second of all is when you're someone shopping at your store and you're putting their stuff in a bag anyways, an easy flyer thrown right in there and print them off for them. Give them an option to do that to get that app out there. You know, Try curbside pickup, download this app, look for our store. Things people step away from these days but are really super important. Local mailers, you will believe the conversion rates on an odd-shaped piece of mail that's a postcard in there. People actually do look at those. And when it's different and it says a message, it's super important people look at. It. So there's so many ways. Local marketing is really simple. Um, and there's a lot of ways to do that in today's day and age. Um, and then Facebook marketing, using things like needles to uh, help you get that message out there, which is a low-cost method at your budget. You know, you're not coming to us and spending to us to look at and think about your ads, $10,000, and then maybe we'll give us a budget and do it. It's, you know, it's cheap, it's self-serve, go and do it, and it's effective. I just thought of how useful this would be for farmer's markets. I always think that I'd love to go to a farmer's market, but you have to show up there at that time. And I haven't been to the local one, and if, but if they have a bag full of goods from a bunch of vendors that I can just go and pick up, that would be fantastic. We have a great local farmer's market, but like just knowing that my local farmer at the market that morning does have what I'm doing, they're not sold out, it would also be a pretty interesting thing. Awesome. Well, we're coming up on time here, Justin. Thank you so much for all the information that you shared here with this idea and the action steps that you've talked through. What's one thing that you would like our listeners to take away from the conversation? I kind of brought up earlier, and I think it's so important. The best things in life come on the opposite side of fear. You know, So take that step over fear. The guy full of wisdom said that, Will Smith. Uh, it stuck with me for a long, long time after I heard that. It's so true. Everyone sees that line, they go, oh, I get really close. I'm like, oh, I should stay at my job a little bit longer. But if you can just walk over and say, I'm willing to take that leap of faith and work hard at it, I think that's the biggest piece of advice I can give anybody. Just do it. Fantastic. Love it. So to the listener who hears this impassioned plea from Justin, go out there, take action, step on the other side of fear, follow through on some of the action steps that we've talked through, come up with your own action steps, let us know what you've done, email us at update at runwithit.fm. Everyone who responds will get exclusive access to a private Facebook group of action takers. You might be able to meet that technical co-founder in there. And one lucky listener will earn a free mentoring session from Justin and potentially a business partnership on this idea. Justin, thank you so much for the time here. Where can listeners go to learn more about what you're doing and some of the services that you offer? Look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I know it's a generic thing, but you can contact me there or email me at jh. So like my initials, jh at needles, N-E-E-D-L-S dot com. Love getting emails. Feel free to reach out to me. And that's why I'm giving it to you guys. If you have questions, concerns, you want to know what we're doing, you just want to ask a question. I've met some really cool people that I ended up doing some awesome business with by uh, putting my name out there and I do it. So let me help you any way I can. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Justin. Great talking with you. We'll give you some time back here. And looking forward to catching up again later on. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, guys. You're doing a great job. Keep up the work and helping all those entrepreneurs out there. So thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Now it's time for you to run with it. Follow through on the action steps discussed and email a summary of what you did to update at runwithit.fm. Every listener who emails us will gain exclusive access to a private Facebook group of action takers. And one listener will earn a free mentoring session with today's guest and potentially a business partnership. Help us build the Run With It community of generous entrepreneurs. Please like, subscribe, and review us online. And remember, the secret of getting ahead is getting started.